Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to my e-learning course on equilibrium of materials. This is lecture number four about the physical fundamentals of equilibrium of materials. Today we are going to talk mostly about isotopes, atomic masses and gravity. Let me show to you a slide from the previous lecture highlighting neutrons and this is because Neutrons make the difference between different isotopes. Isotopes are different versions of the same element with the same number of protons, but with, the, with different numbers of neutrons in the nuclei. And that is why isotopes of the same element differ mostly in the atomic masses. The isotopes differ very little in their chemical behavior, and this is because the chemical behavior is mostly determined by the outer electrons, and it's obvious that the outer electrons are influenced very little uh, by the fact that uh, there is a smaller or larger number of neutrons in the nucleus. Now let me show to you the simplest isotope in nature, isotope called H1, and I hope you recognize that this is exactly the same picture I showed to you the previous time and introduced to you as a hydrogen atom. Now this first isotope of hydrogen makes up 99.98% of element hydrogen, and that is why actually in the first approximation during the previous lecture I called it a hydrogen atom. But nature is more difficult. Nature contains a second natural hydrogen isotope called H2, and it makes up 0.02% of element hydrogen. And there is an obvious rule that the sum of all the mole percents of all the isotopes of the same element must be 100%. Now, by the way, the name of the second hydrogen isotope is heavy hydrogen or deuterium. I hope you can see very well what is the same in the two hydrogen isotopes. It is the number of protons, so both contain one proton, and the number of electrons, both contain one electron. And obviously you can also see very well the difference between the two isotopes. Isotope H1 contains zero neutron, while isotope H2 contains one neutron. By the way, the number after the chemical symbol, which is 1 for H1 and 2 for H2, is called the mass number of the given isotope. And the mass number is nothing else as the sum of the numbers of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And by the way, this was the number we used during the previous lecture to estimate the atomic mass of the atoms. But now we can use exactly the same rule to estimate the atomic mass for the isotope. So therefore, the atomic mass for isotope H1 is 1 gram per mole, estimated approximately, while the approximated atomic mass for isotope H2 is 2 grams per mole. Now what about the average atomic mass of the element? Now in case when you have more than one isotopes for the same element, of course it is more difficult to calculate compared to the case when the given element contains only a single isotope. But in this partic particular case of hydrogen it's not really difficult because one of the isotopes H1 is in such a majority that we can bravely estimate that the approximated atomic mass of element hydrogen is around 1 gram per mole. And this is because the role of heavy hydrogen is almost neglig negligible due to this very low concentration. Now how you can calculate the number of neutrons in the given isotope? Well, for that you take the mass number and then minus the atomic number and that results to the number of neutrons. But of course for that you need to remember the atomic number. And you should remember after the previous lecture that the atomic number for hydrogen is 1, meaning it contains 1 proton. So if you know that, then it's easy to calculate the number of neutrons in heavy hydrogen, 
which is 2 minus 1 equals 1 neutron. Okay, in a little bit more difficult example, isotope C12. Uh, the mass number is, is 12, but you hopefully remember that carbon is element number 6, so the atomic number is 6, so the number of protons is 6, so the number of neutrons follows like 12 minus 6 equals, equals 6 neutrons in the isotope of C12. In a more difficult example of isotope U235, U is for uranium, you should remember that uranium is element number 92, so it contains 92 protons. So the number of neutrons in isotope U235 is obviously 235 minus 92, which is 143 neutrons. Now let me show to you the graph which I promised long before and this is about the ratio of neutrons to protons in different isotopes. On x-axis I am showing Z capital which is the symbol for the atomic number which is of course the same as the number of protons and on the y-axis I am showing to you the number of neutrons in different isotopes. As you can see, for example, at Z equals 50, for exactly the same atomic number, 50, we have many points. Well, the points are more or less overlapping, by the way, but we have many points, meaning we have many isotopes. So the possible interval with neutrons is, for this case, Z equals 50, is something like Zn equals uh, 61 till 70 something. So that means we have average several isotopes per element. And by the way that also means that of course the ratio of neutrons to protons cannot be the same value for each isotope. Now here I am using uh, three different symbols for the points. Blue dots mean a stable isotope with the odd atomic number. Red dots mean a stable isotope with even atomic number. And I hope that you can see that we have much more red points compared to the blue points. What is the reason? Atomic physics teaches us that the reason is that when a nucleus contains an even number of protons then these nucleus will be much more stable compared to other nuclei which contain the odd number of protons. Now finally we also use this triangle which note the unstable isotopes. Unstable isotope means that it undergoes radioactive decay and it is probably not surprising that we have many those unstable isotopes for the radioactive elements. You remember that uh, the last elements are mostly radioactive. By the way, in this graph I am showing only the natural elements from atomic number 1 for hydrogen till atomic number 94 for plutonium. Okay, now let me come back to the question of the ratio of neutrons to protons and to help the eye I am showing a broken line with this ratio 1 neutron to 1 proton and the second broken line with the ratio of 1.5 neutrons to 1 proton. As you can see when the atomic number is small, something like below maybe 20, then the number of neutrons approximately equals the number of protons and in this region therefore we can approximate the atomic mass as the double of the atomic number but of course with plus minus 4 which is quite quite high here. Now if we increase the atomic number above this limit of maybe 20 then this rule is broken and actually 
uh, we go up to the ratio of one and a half neutrons to one proton for the atomic number of 80 or so. And that is why the rule that the number of neutrons is the same as the number of protons in the element is generally not true. Now why it is important, by the way? I actually asked this question and promised this graph when we discussed the Avogadro number and the SI system introduced the definition for the Avogadro number that is the number contained exactly, number of atoms contained exactly in 12 grams of the C12 isotope. And remember the C12 isotope is the one when this rule is hold, so we have 6 protons and 6 neutrons. And I presumed that it has uh, some sense, it has some point only because in this way the more masses of protons and neutrons, which differ a little bit, 0.14% as we saw in the previous lecture, so these molar masses are averaged. But this has a sense and the value for us only if the number of protons and neutrons are the same in all isotopes or elements, but as you see it's really not the case and therefore we can really ask the question what was the point for this definition of the overall number by the SI system? So we see there was practically no point. The only consequence is that now you should remember that nine digit number for the Avogadro number instead of having a one digit number but as I mentioned before we are over this question. Rather let me explain to you that we have 80 natural elements with at least one natural stable isotope each. By the way, what the stable isotope means, the stable isotope means it uh, doesn't undergo any radioactive decay or at least it is not measurable by us. But there are much more, 253 stable natural isotopes for those 80 natural elements. Well, this was obvious before, so we have seen before that we have much more isotopes than elements, so average we have several isotope per element. Now by the way the record holder is this element number 50 which is by the way tin which contains as many as 10 stable isotopes but unfortunately as you see it also contains uh, the 11th unstable isotope so we should discuss later but during the same lecture whether element tin is stable or not. Now when I told you we have the 80 natural elements I hope you are surprised because during the previous lecture we discussed 81 and the plus one is the so-called practically stable natural element is bismuth. Now bismuth is element by the way number 83 it's here you see element number 82 which is lead contains several stable isotopes but element number 83 contains only two unstable isotopes. Well, one of those unstable isotopes is really very much radioactive, but its content in earth crust is negligible. Uh, we call it a trace isotope. It cannot be even measured how much this isotope, uh, of this isotope is contained in element bismuth as average. So the other, the second isotope of bismuth approximately makes up 100% of element bismuth but this is much much less radioactive than the first one. Now of course how much less we should again consider later whether we really can call element bismuth a practically stable element. Now by the way how the mathematics results uh, 83 here because I mentioned before 81 so this is because you remember hopefully that element number 43 here technetium is a radioactive element it doesn't have any stable isotopes and also element number 61 prometheum it's here 
it also doesn't have any stable isotopes, so it's also radioactive. So therefore, MN number 83 minus the 2 uh, leads to 81 stable or practically stable elements. Now, we don't have only stable natural isotopes, we have also 105 unstable isotopes. And the problem is that 32 of them, these triangles, are within the so-called stable element. So we should really consider this question during this lecture later, whether these elements can be really called stable or not. Well, it is less problematic that we have a further 73 unstable isotope which belong to the 13 radioactive elements because of course a radioactive element is radioactive because it is made of radioactive isotopes. Now, altogether we have 358 natural isotopes, but the physicists, you remember, they created 24 artificial elements. And in the same way, they also created 1000 plus artificial isotopes. And most of them actually belong to the stable elements. Now, to my best knowledge, all of those artificially created 1000 plus isotopes are actually strongly radioactive. And that is why, unfortunately, they are useless for us, materials engineers or metallurgical engineers. Now let me explain to you how we get the modern values for atomic masses. But before that, let me remind you from the previous lecture that since 1858, thanks to Cannizzaro, we actually have a good system of relative atomic masses. Now the only problem with them is that they are not accurate enough for my purposes, so uh, the values are known with two or maximum three digits of accuracy. However, when I am performing engineering calculations, I usually start with four digit values, then I get of course the result in also four digit accuracy, and maybe I round up this result to three digits. Therefore, I need to know all the atomic masses of all the elements with the accuracy of at least uh, four digits. And that is why these values of Candizaro are not sufficient for me. Okay, let me remind you that uh, we have the so-called mass number, we denote it now by Y, which is nothing else as the sum of the uh, atomic number, which is the number of protons, and the number of neutrons in uh, that isotope. So in this uh, way we actually can identify all the isotopes using two numbers, Z and Y. So Z identifies the element and Y identifies the isotope through uh, its uh, mass number. So for example we have this C12 isotope, I would rather call it a 612 isotope, or even maybe uh, it can be called like 6C12 isotope, because that gives all information we need, the number of protons, the total number of protons and neutrons, and then the number of neutrons can be obtained uh, as 12 minus 6 equals 6. Now, more important that we have a very good method called mass, mass spectrometry, and of course a device or the family of devices called mass spectrometers which are able to measure the masses of flying individual atoms in vacuum. And then of course if you multiply the measured mass of such an atom by the Avogadro number then you get the molar mass of the given atom. Well if the sample contains several atoms, atom types with several different masses, then actually they separate in this device mass spectrometer and the masses of each type of atom can be separately measured. And therefore of course also the concentration of those different types of atoms can be measured. However, let me mention that unfortunately the accuracy to measure the concentration is much lower compared to the accuracy to measure the mass. Now suppose we have 
a sample which contains only a single element. Now this is of course because we purify the sample obtained from the earth crust from all other elements. So now we have it uh, only made of uh, the element we are interested in. But remember of course uh, this element contains all the natural isotopes which are there in the earth crust. And then if we measure uh, the sample by mass spectrometry then we can obtain the average mole mass of this element using this equation. Where Fz is the atomic mass of this element Z, Xzy is the mole fraction of isotope Y within this element Z, and capital M Zy is the atomic mass of isotope Y of this element Z. Summation is by the isotopes uh, of the given element. Obviously, the problem simplifies a lot if a given element contains only a single isotope. In this case, there is no need in summation, and of course, the mole fraction of that single isotope is 1, or if you like, 100%. And then, of course, the atomic mass of the element equals the atomic mass of that isotope. Otherwise, this equation actually provides the averaging of the atomic mass of the isotopes, but this averaging is uh, done by weighing, and the weight is actually the mole fraction of different isotopes. It means that if a given isotope has a mole fraction of like 0 0.99, then of course it has a very high weight, and that is why it becomes very important in uh, determining the value of the average atomic mass of the element. For example, uh, at the beginning of this lecture you have seen that element hydrogen has two isotopes. Isotope H1 contains 99.98 mole percent uh, in the uh, element hydrogen. In mole fractions it means 0 0.9998 and that is why, according to this rule, of course, the average atomic mass of element hydrogen is very much similar to that of isotope H1. As mentioned above, the accuracy to measure the masses of the atoms in mass spectrometer is much higher compared to measuring the concentration of the isotopes. That is why uh, we need to consider the 81 stable elements in three different groups. Okay, uh, those three groups contain 20 plus 48 plus 13 elements, altogether 81 stable elements. In the first group we have 20 elements. They are so special, so they form a special group, because each of them have only a single isotope. And this is a very lucky situation because in this case, we don't need to bother ourselves with the inaccuracy to measure the concentration of the isotope. And that is why, of course, uh, the atomic masses of these 20 elements are known with the highest precision uh, from 7 to 12 digits for the different elements. Now maybe we should stop for a moment at these 12 digits of accuracy, because you remember how we get the atomic mass? we measure the mass of the atom and multiply it by the Avogadro number. But you remember that the Avogadro number is a 9-digit number, so it is known to 9 digits accuracy. So then, how we can get the final result with more than 9 digits of accuracy? And this is of course questionable, but the answer is that since 2019, the SI system of units considers the Avogadro number as one of its base constants with a fixed value. And that is why inaccuracies in the Avogadro number are not considered anymore. And then it is clear how the atomic mass can be known with 12 digits. But the bottom line is that we are lucky. I mean, I am lucky because I requested to know all the atomic masses with the accuracy of at least four digits. And now uh, my request is satisfied, at least for the first 20 elements. By the way, let me note that 95% of these elements are 
belong to odd atomic number elements, okay, except beryllium. That means all these elements contain an odd number of protons in the nuclei, meaning the nuclei are relatively unstable, and by the way, that is why we have a small amount of stable isotopes, well, so small that actually for each of those 20 elements we have only one isotope each. Now, the second group contains 48 elements. For them, we have already more than one isotope per element, but those isotopes at least uh, have a stable distribution in Earth crust. Meaning, when, wherever you take the sample from the Earth crust and you study its isotopic concentration using mass spectrometry, you get the same result, of course, within the accuracy of mass spectrometry. And because of this inaccuracy is involved in the calculation of the final average atomic mass of the element, so that is why, unfortunately, the accuracy of this value is now only four to eight digits of precision, which you remember is much lower than uh, the values before, seven to 12 digits. Nevertheless, I am still happy because even these 48 elements, so the atomic masses of all these 48 elements are still known with at least four digits of accuracy, which is good. Now, by the way, 71% of the elements in this group are even numbered elements, meaning there is an even number of protons in the nuclei, meaning the nuclei are quite stable, and that is why they have a larger number of different isotopes, because the even number of protons make those nuclei stable. So, funny conclusion is that the more stable is your nuclei, the less you know the atomic mass of that element, because the more isotopes you form. Now finally, in the third group we have 13 elements. Uh, they are so special, uh, not only because each of them also contains more than one isotope, but moreover, the distribution of those isotopes is not even in the Earth crust. It means that if you take samples from different places of the Earth crust, you will find that the isotopes of these elements are different in different samples beyond the accuracy of mass spectrometry. So this difference is significant. And that means that we even cannot uh, provide a single value for the atomic mass of those elements. We can only provide a possible interval. The most problematic is lithium. For lithium, we know today that its atomic mass is anything between 6.938 and 6.997 gram per mole, meaning the uncertainty is plus minus 0.42%, so the difference between the lowest possible and highest possible values is almost 1%. That means that, for example, for lithium, we surely don't know its atomic mass with uh, the required four digit, digits accuracy. Similarly problematic are argon, boron, sulfur, chlorine, and hydrogen. So altogether we have six problematic elements for which, unfortunately, the atomic masses are not known with the required accuracy. However, we are a little bit lucky here because uh, the rest of the seven elements of this group, although they have also uncertainties, but this uncertainty is below 0.01%, so for the rest of the seven elements it is not a practical problem for us if we want to work with a four-digit accuracy. Now let me try to explain how is it possible that uh, in different samples uh, coming from different parts of the Earth crust you find different isotopic uh, concentrations.
At the very beginning, when the Earth was formed, and that was billions of years ago, because, well, actually, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Now, at the very beginning, Earth was obviously a liquid sphere, fully liquid, because its temperature was so high. And I am pretty sure that uh, in that liquid sphere, the distribution of all elements and isotopes was really homogeneous. And this is because liquid is, liquids are easily mixed. But then, uh, at a certain moment of time, but still billions of years ago, a solid crust formed on the surface of the Earth. Now today, as I told you already, this crust is like 10, 30, 50 kilometers thick. But of course, at the very beginning, it was maybe only one meter thick or thin, and then it was growing uh, gradually with time. But at the moment, when uh, the solid core or crust, sorry, was formed from uh, the liquid sphere or on the surface of the liquid sphere, the composition of the solid core was homogeneous. By the way, it was not the same as the composition of the liquid, and in this uh, course on equilibrium materials, we will see that generally the compositions of two different phases being in equilibrium are usually different. So the composition of the solid crust and the liquid underneath were different, but because the liquid was homogeneous, obviously the solid crust was also homogeneous. But then, you know, billions of years passed with the same solid car, uh, solid crust, sorry, and uh, in different parts of the Earth crust, the meteorological conditions were very different. Some samples were dissolving and then precipitating back, uh, some others were evaporating and then uh, condensing back. Some others were melting and freezing. And, you know, all these cycles were taking place uh, millions of times during those billions of years. In each of these little cycles, the isotopic uh, concentration changed only a little bit, which was not measurable. But, you know, during the billions of years, all those little changes accumulated, and this is how in certain parts of the Earth crust, the composition of the given isotope of, say, lithium is one, and in some other place it is something else. Okay? Now, can it be a problem for us? Well, yes, it can be a serious problem uh, for us. It's actually, it is a serious problem, even if this problem is not really recognized by people yet. Let's take lithium as an example. We use lithium mostly to make lithium batteries to store electric energy. In these batteries, lithium is not used for its mass. Rather, Lithium is used for its atoms or ions because each ion of lithium is able to transfer one electron from one electrode to another electrode through the electrolyte. And this is how actually electric energy is stored. So that is why if we purchase the same one kilogram of lithium uh, in two different lots, in one lot is it, 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 it might have a higher amount of lithium in the second lot it can be it, it can have a lower amount of lithium and that will lead to the fact that the lithium battery will be able to store less or more electric energy and of course this is problematic because we at least need to control what is going on but this uncertainty usually we don't control in terms of material science, or this course of equilibrium of materials, we have two different problems. The first problem is that certain physical chemical properties might be dependent on these atomic masses, or actually isotopic uh, composition. But of course, we have very different properties. There are certain properties which are quite insensitive to those changes. For example, we already discussed uh, the stoichiometry of lithium oxide, which we found as Li2 
2O. Now this geometry I am pretty sure is absolutely independent on the uh, atomic mass or isotopic distribution of lithium. On the other hand, think some other property, rather a physical property like density. You know density is the mass divided by volume. Okay, so if you take two samples with different atomic masses, but in both samples we take one mole of amount of matter, then actually the volumes of the two samples will be pretty much the same. And this is because the volume of one atom is mostly determined by the radius of the outer electron shell, as I showed you before. Now that is practically independent or almost absolutely independent if, he, if, if you have one neutron more or one neutron less in the nucleus. So the volume is pretty the same, but the masses are different. So dividing mass, different masses by the same volume, you get different densities. Well, it's a bad news because then we don't really control the properties of materials. Well, of course, it's also kind of a good news because that means that uh, uh, you have a good basis to separate those isotopes. For example, if you use a centrifuge, then the isotopes can be separated based on their densities. Okay. Uh, Another problem which we have in this course particularly, it is how to recalculate uh, precisely mass percent to mole percent. Because you remember we are measuring mass and then we are using the uh, atomic masses to get uh, the moles. Now if the atomic masses are uncertain, of course the mole percent will be uncertain. Let me show to you uh, this situation, this graph. I am showing two aluminum alloys with different alloying elements called M. M can be lithium, argon, boron, sulfur. I mean, I just took the, f the first four most problematic elements, of course. Let's consider lithium. On X, I am showing the lithium weight percent in that alloy. And as a function of that, I am calculating the uncertainty in the more percents of this lithium in this in the in the same alloy using the two extreme values of the atomic masses. Now what I get, you remember the atomic masses had uh, the atomic mass had an uncertainty of 0.42% and the same 0.42% you find for the diluted solution of lithium in this alloy. Okay, in another extreme, when you have 100 per mass percent of lithium, then of course you will have also 100 mass percent of uh, more percent of lithium, whichever atomic mass you use, simply because there is nothing else in the sample, only lithium. It means that the uncertainty here is actually zero. It's okay, but what is in between? In between, we have a large amount of different alloys with different compositions, and you see even the 0.1% uncertainty, which means three digits of uncertainty, takes place for alloys uh, approximately uh, uh, for ap approximately 50% of the alloys, and even the majority of that is uncertain with 0.01% of uncertainty, meaning four digits. So there is a real problem, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what to do? You know, when we have a problem, usually we also have also a solution. But usually the, sol the solution is expensive. It happens in real life, it happens also in science. So now we have a problem. Fine, what to do? Remember, if we measure each sample separately in the mass spectrometer, then we can measure uh, the isotope distribution in that particular sample and of course can calculate the pre precisely, much more precisely, the atomic mass of lithium in that sample. So we can do that. It is possible. But unfortunately, you know, at this department of material science engineering, we never had a mass spectrometer. And this is because, you know, this is a, a job of physicists and chemists. Of course, we can send each sample of lithium to somewhere else 
asking them to measure the actual uh, atomic mass of lithium but obviously it cost money it cost time <coughs> and of course it, it it needs some attention it even needs some knowledge you need to know that the problem exists and uh, actually majority of materials and metallurgical engineers today to my best knowledge simply have no idea that such a problem exists so I'm teaching you this course that you, my international students and my other listeners, thank you for listening, uh, get know that we have such a problem. We have, of, of course, the solution. Well, the solution is a little bit expensive, but doable. Okay, so now we have seen how we can get the approximated average value of the atomic mass of the elements from the measured atomic masses of the isotopes. I think it is time that we make a simple model for these atomic mass of the isotopes. You know this course, Secular with Materials, is about modeling and I want to show to you this example because I want to explain to you what is the purpose of modeling. You might think it is only to predict something which we don't know, a property or a phenomenon or whatever, but usually, for me, it has a larger meaning. When I make a model, of course, first I always make the simplest possible and but still reasonable model. Then I get a value. Then I compare this value with the measured value. Then I always get a difference. And then this is the point when I can learn something. Because I, I, I want to improve my knowledge through modeling. So I did see the difference between the modeled value and the experimental value, and this is the source of new information. If I'm good enough, I can explain the difference, or at least 90% or 50% of the difference, by taking into account something additional, something which I neglected in the very first model. And during this course, my knowledge increases, improves and also the models becomes better and better. Right, now I am making a model for the atomic mass of isotope Y of element Z. For that I take into account the masses of protons, electrons and neutrons. You remember we discussed them in the previous lecture. And by the way, it's also very important in modeling, I will neglect all the masses of the rest of the elementary particles and the nuclei. You remember we talked about the zoo of elementary particles. So that zoo will be neglected in the first approximation. So what I practically do, I take the mass of protons and mass, mass of a proton and mass of an electron, multiply it by uh, the atomic number because the atomic number is actually the number of protons and electrons in the neutral atom of that isotope and then I add to it the uh, mass of a neutron multiplied by its number and the number of neutrons is calculated as a difference between the mass number and the atomic number and this follows from this definition and that's it. That's the whole first order modeling. But usually I also have a hypothesis, meaning an expectation. What I expect from my model. From this particular model, I was sure that I will get a lower, a smaller number, a smaller value for the atomic mass compared to the experimental value. And why so? Well, this is because I ne neglected the masses of the whole zoo of the elementary particles. And then, surprise, surprise, when I made all these calculations, compared the results, I got the opposite answer. I found that for each isotope, the calculated by myself value is higher and not lower compared to the experimental value. Okay, because this is true, or this was found for each isotope, it is obviously not due to some experimental scatter. Now this must be a rule. So this is time to think more. What might be the reason? 
Let me remind you, when during the previous lecture I explained to you the masses of the elementary particles, I also explained that those are the so-called rest masses, and the rest here means that these are the so-called independent masses, so these are the masses of the elementary particles before they come together to form a nucleus or an atom. And I also explained to you that when a nucleus is formed uh, with a neutron and a proton coming together, then there is a very very strong nuclear bond formed between neutrons and protons. Okay, but then if there is a very very strong bond, it means there must be a huge energy change upon the formation of these nuclei, and if so, then it might be accompanied by a mass change. And this follows the idea of Albert Einstein. You remember this iconic formula that the energy and the mass are interconnected. So if uh, we make this second hypothesis, then I should add a new term to this equation. This new term is delta m. This L delta m is due to the energy change accompanying the formation of the nucleus or the atom. And because that process is negative, I mean that process is spontaneous, so the energy accompanying that process is negative. And then let me rewrite this equation of Einstein using the deltas, because the delta m is proportional to delta E, so the change in the mass should be proportional to the change of the energy. The proportional constant is the square of the velocity of light in vacuum. And as I just explained, delta E has a negative value, and that is why delta M also has a negative value. From the big statistics for all the isotopes, you get approximately minus 1% of correction, meaning you get the first order model, what I did first, and if you decrease its value by approximately 1%, then you will get the experimental value. But of course you should understand that each isotope is different, so this correction is different for each isotope. The only thing which is the same, it is the sign. It is also a negative correction. But it can be minus 0 0.5, minus whatever. So actually the difference between different elements is larger than 0.1%, much larger than 0.1% in this correction. And by the way, Hopefully for the last time, let me remind you how the SI system of unit defined the Avogadro number. They said this number equals the number of atoms, exactly in 12 grams of C12 isotope, and they did this very difficult uh, definition for averaging the rest masses of neutrons and protons, which differ from each other only by 0.14%. Now, at the beginning of this lecture, we already seen it had absolutely no sense because the number of neutrons is usually larger than the number of protons in isotopes, and that's why this averaging has no sense, no value. But here we see that you actually have another correction, and this correction makes additional difference between different elements more than 0.1%, and that proves again that this kind of an overcomplicated definition of the Ogodro number was useless. Okay, let me come back to this business. So, once I learned something, let me apply my knowledge to get more knowledge. How can I do that? So, we have the experimental values for atomic uh, masses of the isotopes. I can easily calculate these theoretical values. I take the difference, so I can obtain delta m. Now multiplying delta m by the square of the velocity of light, I get delta e. Delta e, the energy change accompanying the formation of nuclei and atoms. And now the question is, how much is that? And uh, how it uh, depends on the atomic number in the periodic system? Okay, now let me show to you this graph, how this delta E energy depends on the atomic number. 
And uh, here I'm showing only the natural isotopes, so I'm showing the atomic number from 1 for hydrogen till 94 for plutonium, which are the natural elements. First, let me draw to you, your attention to the huge uh, values along axis Y, which is the energy axis. This is measured in gigajoule per mole of protons and neutrons. Now, if I multiply these values by the mass number, I get gigajoule per mole atom. But then if I divide it back by the atomic mass, I get gigajoule per gram. You know, it's a little bit strange how this gigajoule per mole proton or neutron is almost the same as the gigajoule per gram. They are not exactly the same because the mass number is not exactly the same as the atomic mass. But they are pretty close, so close that the finite size of these symbols actually uh, covers the difference. First let me explain to you what happens to isotope H1. Remember, it contains only a single proton and a single electron. And now if they interact, the interaction energy seems to be zero, which is actually a negative value. It seems to be zero only compared to these gigajoule per mole values. But then, if you take the second isotope of hydrogen, H2, remember it also contains a neutron, and in this case the nuclear reaction between neutrons and protons might take place, and it take, takes place, and then we already get the order of magnitude of minus 100 gigajoule per mole. So that comparison proves to us that all the values, except of course H1, so all the values we see here in this graph actually correspond to the interaction between protons and neutrons and not to the interaction between the protons and the electrons. Next, please note we have a minimum in this graph. To see it better, I enlarged the y-axis. So left I am showing the axis from 0 to minus 1000 gigajoule per mole. On the right I showed the same, I mean a small part here, from minus 700 to minus 850 gigajoule per mole. In this way of course the minimum becomes more obvious. Please note that the minimum is actually the double minimum. We have two dots, one for one of the isotopes of iron, another one for one of the isotopes of nickel, and uh, they have almost the same and most negative energy in this graph, and that means that among all the elements in nature, iron and nickel have the most stable nuclei. You might remember I mentioned this when we discussed the core of the Earth, which is made of the iron-nickel alloy, and I also mentioned that there might be some connection between these two facts. Okay, please also note that uh, for the interval of atomic number something between 20 and 40, we have a relatively shallow minimum here. Well, of course, the values change a little bit, but not that much. However, if you go with the atomic number above the value of 40, then increasing further the atomic number, the delta E value will be gradually increased towards more and more positive values. And here the more and more positive values mean less and less stable nuclei of those isotopes. And that is why, by the way, Elements with atomic numbers starting from 84 and further are unstable elements. Unstable meaning they are radioactive. The radioactive decay, by the way, will be discussed in the next slide. And in the next slide, the same uh, diagram will be shown, but only a small part of it between lead and uranium. I am telling it now because I want you to remember the whole picture and the small part to be shown in the next slide. But here I want to discuss not uh, the radioactive decay, rather I want to discuss nuclear fission. 
if we take an isotope uranium-235 and add to it some uh, a neutron, now then nuclear fission can take place. For example, it forms crypto-92 and barium-141, by the way, both are very radioactive isotopes, and it also forms free neutrons. And, very important to us, it is accompanied, this process is accompanied by the release of 72 gigajoule of energy per gram of uranium-235. You see this is because the direction of this process is from top right down left to these low energy states. So nuclear fission is when a large nucleus is divided into two much smaller nuclei, which are not exactly the same, but more or less similar to each other. In size, I mean. Now why we call this nuclear fission also sometimes chain, chain reaction? Well, this is because from one neutron we got three neutrons. And I imagine we are able to feed those three neutrons back to the reaction and find for them, for each of them, one atom of uranium-235. Then in the next cycle we will get nine neutrons. And now suppose we are able to feed back those nine neutrons and to find for each of those neutrons one atom U235 and then we end up in the second cycle with 27 neutrons, etc, etc, etc. So this process of producing neutrons and by the way producing energy is accelerating. And when it is so, from outside it seems to be an atomic bomb. But atomic bombs don't always happen. They take place only if the initial mass of uranium was larger than the certain critical value called critical mass. Let me explain. Suppose we have a small mass of uranium together, so it's a small volume, and this small volume has a lot, relatively large uh, surface area. You know the ratio between surface area and volume is called the specific surface area, and through this relatively large specific surface area we have a high chance that the neutrons will escape from the sample to the surroundings and then these neutrons are not able to accelerate the chain reaction. However, if the mass is large, the volume is large, then the specific surface area is relatively low and through this relatively small surface area the neutrons cannot escape so the majority of them uh, is still in the sample and accelerates the chain reaction. Now let me ask you a question. What do you think? When mankind first discovered this phenomenon of nuclear fission with chain reaction, what we did with that discovery? I mean, we had a choice to develop a very efficient nuclear plant for peaceful production of energy, or we had a choice to build first an atomic bomb to kill each other with a higher efficiency. Well, obviously all of you know from your study of studies of history that first the atomic bomb was built. Well, I am not going to discuss its political and ethical issues. Rather, let me ask you an engineering question, a dilemma. And the dilemma was that if you use too little uranium in the atomic bomb below the critical mass, then the bomb will never work. However, if you use too much uranium in the atomic bomb above the critical mass, then the bomb will be activated even during its production, which is of course not needed. So the question is how to produce the safe atomic bomb, I mean safe from the point of view of uh, the producers and of course not from the point of view of those people who are bombed. And by the way, I'm very sorry for all my Japanese friends. Now the engineering solution was that you take one and a half times 
the mass, the, the critical mass. But divide into two parts, into two half spheres. So each half sphere takes 75% of the critical mass, so that is safe. Then you put all, both of these half spheres into the same atomic bomb, but separated. So it will never be activated spontaneously. However, you surround those two half spheres by TNT explosive in a way that when you activate the TNT, then it uh, joins together to two half spheres into a single sphere in a way that its mass is increased above the critical mass and then the atomic bomb is activated. Okay, dear international students, once I am teaching to you how to make an atomic bomb, let me also teach to you how to make a nuclear power plant, a peaceful nuclear power plant. Well, the secret is that in this process you need to feed back in each cycle only one neutron and find one new U235 for these to keep the process running with the same speed and to produce all the time this energy, not more. So to make sure that this chain reaction is not accelerated. For that, two out of those three neutrons you should take out and actually it's done in a way that uh, uranium rods are positioned into a big vessel, steel vessel, full of water. And then these two neutrons are coming out into water. Uh, water is heated up due to neutrons. Water is evaporated. Water steam is formed. It is led on turbine. And then the turbine produces electric energy. Now, this electric energy is the final product of the nuclear power plant. Fine. But, what to do with that steam which is hot? Now, a similar process takes place actually in coal power plants, when they burn coal. Again, evaporate water, get the steam, run the turbines, etc. And there, in coal plants, usually they let out this hot steam because it's not dangerous at all and that will be too uh, costly to, to take care of it. However, in the nuclear power plant, remember you form these isotopes. Now one of those isotopes, krypton, is a gaseous product because krypton is actually one of the Nobel gases. But its isotope krypton-92, which is formed uh, during nuclear fission, is very much radioactive. And, unfortunately, steam, water steam, is contaminated by this very much radioactive Krypton-92. Meaning, you cannot let this hot steam out containing Krypton-92, because if you do so, you kill people in the surrounding of the nuclear power plant. So you should treat your steam in a closed circle. For that, you need to cool it down, and condense it back to liquid water. For that you need a huge amount of energy. Of course, you might have an idea why don't we use the energy produced by a nuclear power plant to cool back uh, the steam, but if you do that, then much probably you lose all what you gained. So instead, uh, we are using renewable energy to cool steam. In Hungary, we have a nuclear power plant at the city of Paks, which is at River Duna, or Danube. The Danube is coming from Germany and provides us a renewable cold water, especially in winter times. Well, in summer times, it is not that cold, but of course it's still colder than the very hot steam. But during this process, of course, the temperature of water in River Danube is increasing and this might be problematic. But now let me rather come back to the question of how we make sure that exactly two neutrons are going out to heat water and only one neutron is uh, keeps the uh, nuclear fission running. Well it is really not that simple 
so we need a safety control system and for that we use control rods made of materials which like to absorb neutrons so if uh, the operators see that the nuclear uh, fission reaction accelerates then they actually uh, put those control rods in between the uranium rods those control rods take up the neutrons and they stop the uh, chain reaction if there is a problem but of course this safety system should be really working and safe because in chernobyl it didn't work properly and that is why the chernobyl nuclear power plant which was planned to be a power plant, a port appeared to be an atomic bomb. Okay, if we can run the power plant, nuclear power plant, in a safe way, then it really produces this huge energy. It's great. Nevertheless, you can observe that the uh, price for this nuclear energy is increasing all the time. And there are several reasons. First of all, the re reason is the nuclear accidents. After each nuclear accident, uh, we make the regulations uh, stronger and stronger. And to obey them, it costs more and more money, and this cost is built into the price. Second, to run a power plant, you need uranium. For that, you need to mine it. The more you mine it, the less you have it in easily accessible places so the more it costs to mine it further moreover safety regulations also work here today uh, we usually don't use living objects people to mine uranium because simply it's so dangerous for their health so everything should be automized and that again leads to increased cost and finally let me come back to the question of what is the product of that nuclear fission Okay, krypton goes to the gas, so that's why we keep water uh, and steam in a closed cycle. So in this way, krypton-92 cannot escape the system. But barium is solid, and this probably remains in the uranium rods, barium-141. And, uh, well, we should do something to it. So what we do, do to it, well, we dig it as deep as possible, to make sure its radiation is not uh, too bad on the surface of the Earth. Well, by the way, you might think uh, I am so an old professor that I have already big problems with my vision. And that is why I start from the point for uranium-235, but I cannot end in a proper point for these two isotopes. Well, you know, this is half a true, but actually this graph contains only points for natural isotopes, while the Krypton-92 and Barium-141 are not natural isotopes, they are so radioactive, so they point size something here indeed, not shown this graph uh, made for natural isotopes. Okay, when you are thinking about this problem, uh, that uh, from the one hand nuclear power plants are a great thing, from the other hand they are not 100% safe and further uh, the price for electric energy from nuclear power plants uh, increase all the time, you might note that this curve with the minimum has actually two sides. Up to now we used only the right hand side of this curve, so we started from top right and we were coming down to this energy minimum to produce energy. But we can also use equally the other side of the curves, starting from left top. And this I show here on the left hand side, when I'm showing an example for nuclear fusion. Well, let me mention there are, of course, many possible nuclear fusion reactions. Here I'm showing maybe the easiest one. Suppose we start with two nuclei of deuterium and they merge together and then we end up in the nucleus of helium-4 
And this is because a nucleus of deuterium heavy uh, hydrogen contains one proton and one neutron, while the nucleus of helium-4 contains two protons and two neutrons. Okay, so this reaction as written here is fine. Note that we have a much higher energy uh, release, minus 468 gigajoule, compared to nuclear fission, minus 72 gigajoule. Moreover, in case of nuclear fusion, it is per gram of deuterium and not per gram of uranium. How good? We needed to mine uranium first to run nuclear fission and first we needed to dig as deep as possible uh, the product barium. But now we don't need to mine anything because deuterium is a natural isotope of hydrogen. Hydrogen uh, is in water, H2O, and that is why we have a kind of free water containing a natural isotope of deuterium. So we can, of course, increase the natural concentration of uh, deuterium in H2O uh, by different techniques. And if we reached uh, the given needed concentration of this deuterium, then we can decompose uh, this so-called heavy water uh, by electrolysis, we get uh, two different gases, oxygen and the deuterium-rich hydrogen. So this is ready for nuclear fusion. Now let me show to you what we get as a result. We get a very friendly noble gas, helium, as a product, it's stable isotope. So we don't need to dig it deep like in case of nuclear fission, we needed to dig barium very deep. It can be released to the atmosphere without any harm. So you know, it's a very good process. Especially that it produces more energy than nuclear fission. So it seems that nuclear fusion is much, much better to produce energy than nuclear fission. So let's do nuclear fusion. Okay. Well, my enthusiastic international students, let me mention we have a couple of little problems here. First of all, if you want to merge two nuclei of deuterium, so you start with two atoms of deuterium, each contains an electron, outside electron, and then if you want to merge the, the nuclei, then those electrons, first of all, start repulsing each other. So it's kind of impossible to do, at least at room temperature. So what you do, you increase temperature to something like 10,000 Kelvin. At that temperature, your gas, deuterium, becomes ionized, so it becomes a plasma. What is plasma? is a hot mixture of charged particles, negatively charged electrons, and positively charged nuclei. So now those nuclei can merge to make the nuclear fusion, but at this temperature they will not. They will not because both nuclei are positively charged, so they repulse each other. Okay, as a methodological engineer, I'm sorry I have no further ideas because I never go even up to 10,000 Kelvin, but physicists don't care they can easily, I mean more or less easily, go up to 10 million or even 100 million kelvins. And if, you, if they go up to that very high temperatures, then the nuclei are flying so fast that uh, they might collide, despite the fact that they repulse each other, and then nuclear fusion happens. And really, this is the way. And by the way, in the center of the Sun, the temperature is above 10 million Kelvin, and something very similar is happening, which is producing so much heat, so we are happy in sunshine. And I can ask you the same question as before, what do you think, what people did first? They did first the nuclear uh, fusion reactor to produce peaceful energy, or first they produced the hydrogen bomb? to kill each other. Again, yes, again, Homo sapiens 
selected to build a hydrogen bomb. The inventors are Teller and Ulam. By the way, Teller is a Hungarian refugee to the United States. It all happened after the Second World War in 1940s, early 1950s. And you can ask me how Teller and Ulam made 10 or 100 million Kelvins in the hydrogen bomb. You know, in the United States, after the war, it was kind of easy because they already had the atomic bomb. So building the hydrogen bomb starts by building, by putting into it an atomic bomb and then of course adding some deuterium. And then you activate your atomic bomb that produces the high temperature and that high temperature activates also the nuclear fusion which we call hydrogen bomb. Okay, that was early 1950 which happened 70 years before. Do you think during the last 70 years anyone could produce a fusion reactor? Unfortunately not. Of course it's difficult, I understand. And the difficulty comes mostly from the very high temperatures. Remember we need tens and hundreds of millions of Kelvin. Obviously we don't have any materials which could make the wall uh, of the crucible to keep the deuterium inside. But remember we have a plasma state in which we have charged electrons and charged also nuclei and they, those charged particles, can be kept together by very strong magnets. Now this is how actually it can be done. But at the moment we are rather talking about it, it's not ready, although European Union is spending a huge amount of taxpayers' money to produce the first prototype of fusion reactor, maybe in 10 or 20 years, we don't know. Well, I hope it will really happen, it's obviously not easy, but this is a big promise. By the way, we already had a false uh, claim on so-called cold fusion from electrochemistry published in an international electrochemical journal. You know, by electrochemical way you can really get rid of uh, those electrons and then indeed the nuclei are free to uh, merge and uh, make the nuclear fusion. But cold fusion means fusion at room temperature and Obviously, at room temperature, the two nuclei, both positively charged, will never come closer to each other and because they repulse each other and will never produce nuclear fusion. So unfortunately, cold fusion was nothing else as a scientific mistake. That teaches us, uh, the international students and me international professors, that we should be very careful when we publish anything. Before we publish, we should think twice what we publish. Is it really proven? Is what we are talking about really the case? Isn't it a kind of a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of the measured data? Moreover, the more bombastic is your paper, the more attention is needed from you to make sure that it is true. Otherwise, you can erode easily your name as a scientist. Now let me mention that if we burn one gram of coal, carbon, then you get 33 kilojoule of energy and even less if you explode one gram of TNT. Now if you compare these values with the 72 gigajoules per gram from nuclear fission and the 400 something gigajoule per gram from nuclear fusion, you can easily calculate that during nuclear fission and especially during uh, fusion, uh, the processes are accompanied by heat release per unit mass of 1 to 100 million times higher than the usual pr uh, processes to produce energy. And then of course you can also compare the nuclear power plants with the coal power plant, the same result. So this is actually why we like so much the existing nuclear power plants and also that is why we hope to uh, make a working, economically working fusion reactor. Because if we can run them in a controlled way, then they produce us really a huge amount of energy which is needed by mankind for peaceful purposes. 
Okay, now let me present the same delta E values in a somewhat different coordinate system. In the previous slide, I showed to you delta E, which is the energy of the formation of the nucleus, as function of Z, and this is the atomic number. So for one single element, such as copper, we had we have one z value, which is by the way 29, and this 29, if we have several natural isotopes, which are shown in the previous slide, then we had a vertical line of different values. Now this time, I am showing the graph only for a single element, which is copper, and I am going to show to you the same delta E value as function of the isotope mass. By blue points, I am showing the natural isotopes. You see we have only two natural isotopes for copper, so if I show only these two points, you wouldn't see too much. And then, of course, I wouldn't show this graph. But, as I mentioned to you before, the physicists created a huge amount of artificial isotopes for all the stable elements, and of course all those artificial isotopes are not stable, but now let me add them here as red points, because if we look together at the red points and the blue points, we see a characteristic minimum, a minimum energy. And approximately the average atomic mass of copper corresponds to this minimum. Okay? Well, I don't claim now that there is a new way to find the average atomic mass of an element to find the minimum of this curve. And this is because, you know, this minimum is quite flat, so it's really not easy to find the value with uh, four digits of accuracy. Not at all. So, of course, I suggest to keep the method we worked out before in this lecture. But why I'm showing to you this graph anyway, this is because the course of equilibrium materials will be based on the great idea that any spontaneous process goes towards the minimum energy. And we will see during the course many examples on physical chemical properties, on phase equilibria, on uh, chemical equilibria, etc., etc., etc. But this time I want to show to you that approximately the rule or the law of minimum energy works also for nuclear reactions. Okay, so there's an example here, and well, let me go on. Now we know everything about nuclear fission and nuclear fusion, but please remember that for nuclear fusion or nuclear fission to happen, we actually need very special conditions. On the other hand, for radioactive decay of the same isotopes, we don't need any special condition. Even at this moment, you are listening to my lecture, radioactive decay of different isotopes underneath is happening in the Earth crust, because there are so many uh, unstable isotopes in the Earth crust. Let me therefore talk about radioactive decay and use uranium as an example. I am giving to you the three different natural isotopes of uranium. They all together provide 100% of element uranium. All the three are radioactive. Uh, that means the half-lives are not infinitely large. What is the half-life? Imagine you put on the table one kilogram of U235 isotope, then you wait for the time period of this half-life, which is, by the way, 70.7 millions of years. Then after this period of time you come back, okay, maybe not you, your grand-grand-grand-son or daughter is coming back to check what is the result of the grand-grand-grand-grand-grand-pass experiment, and what he or she will find that half of the uranium is still there intact, but another half is transformed into something else. So that's the half-life. So please note, 
the difference between fusion and fission versus the radioactive decay. If an atomic bomb or if the hydrogen bomb is activated, then everything happens within a second. However, for radioactive decay to happen, you should wait millions of years. Now let me show you more details what is happening during the radioactive decay, decay of this U235 isotope. I am showing the previous graph, its top right corner actually. In terms of uh, atomic numbers, I show it in the interval between 80 to 94. In terms of energy, I am showing that graph from minus 720 to minus 770 gigajoule per mole. Element 92 is uranium. This middle isotope is actually the U235 and by black arrows I am showing the sequence of radioactive decay steps. And the final destination is PB lead 207 isotope. Why lead? Now this is because as element number 82, this is the highest atomic number element which has stable isotopes. By the way, it has actually four stable isotopes, although the points are overlapping here. So that is why all isotopes which have a higher uh, atomic number than 82 uh, and undergo radioactive decay, they usually end up as one of the stable lead isotopes as a rule. Now if we go into details we see actually two different types of those black arrows. One is going from right to left with the step of two atomic numbers. Okay, there are seven of them. And the other type of arrow goes from left to the right by one atomic number. Now the first one is called actually the alpha decay. The alpha decay, the example for that is when uranium-235 produces thorium-231 and helium. The alpha radiation, which is the result of the alpha decay, is actually the nucleus of helium, which contains, as you know, two protons and two neutrons. Now, if you happen to stand nearby, when such uh, an alpha decay happens, then this alpha radiation is actually uh, very dangerous for your body because your tissues are damaged by these flying uh, helium nucleus. So that is why usually radioactive decay is dangerous. Now the second type of a process is shown here. We call it a beta process or beta decay. For example, thorium-231 transforms into productinium-231. Okay, at the first sight you might think nothing is happening because the mass number is the same, but please note that productinium has a higher atomic number by one compared to thorium. That's why to form productinium from thorium you need an additional electron and an additional proton. Now how it goes? Well, uh, it happens that one of the neutrons of thorium-231 transforms into an electron plus a proton plus an antineutrino. Now, by the way, this antineutrino is one of the members of the many elementary particles in that zoo of the elementary particles into which I am not really going to, into the details. Summarizing, after all these little steps are happening, then the summary process is that from one atom of U235, we get one atom of PB207 plus seven atoms of helium. Why seven? Okay, how many long arrows we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And more importantly, the energy release accompanying this uh, sequence of processes is altogether minus 17.8 gigajoule per gram of uranium. If we compare it to the energy release accompanying nuclear fission of the same isotope U235, you remember from the previous slide we get minus 72 gigajoule per gram. 
Okay, not very much larger, by the way, only four times. But please don't make a mistake. Please don't consider radioactive decay as 25% of an atomic bomb. It is not. And the huge difference is not in the energy. In the energy, we don't have such a huge difference. The huge difference is the rate of the process, how fast it takes place. As I explained, when we activate the atomic bomb, everything happens within a second. But we cannot activate radioactive decay. It goes with such half-lives of 70 million years, so the rate is much, 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 much slower in case of radioactive decay. But once I talk about the rate of the process, so let, let me be a little bit more scientific and show to you this equation. N, capital N, means the number of atoms, little t means time. dN over dt means the change of the, in the number of atoms as a function of time. It was found that is actually this change is proportional to the actual number of the atoms because each of these atoms of those isotopes uh, takes, uh, I mean, can undergo radioactive decay. Uh, but of course, you never know which atom is next. You only know if you have a large enough number of atoms that radioactive decay uh, is happening with a certain probability. Now, this probability, if it's low or high, it is actually uh, taken into account by this coefficient called the dk constant, little k. And very importantly, you have a negative sign. The negative sign tells us that n actually decreases with time. Now, this is a differential equation, but an easy one, because you can divide this equation by capital N and multiply it by dt. In this case, you get dn over n equals minus k times dt. And now you can integrate both sides of this differential equation using some reasonable boundary conditions, and this is easy to set. At time zero, when we start uh, our considerations, or experiment, uh, we can note n as n0, so this is the starting number of atoms uh, corresponding to zero time. And then after some time t, we will have some number of n atoms n. So the final equation for the rate of this process is written like this, so the n this is the remaining number of atoms, will equal the initial number of atoms, exponential minus kt. So it also, of course, depends on time, and n capital decreases uh, with time. Let me also mention that uh, very similar equations can be obtained not only for the number of atoms, but also for the amount of matter, little n, and also for mass, little m. Now, what to do for these? Well, first of all, let me divide both sides of this equation by the Avogadro number. I can do that, you know, any equation can be multiplied or divided by the same constant, no problem. If you don't like this idea, then they cancel out. But we usually do it for some purpose. In this case, we do it for a purpose that capital N divided by the regular number uh, is actually little n, which is the amount of matter, and that takes place on both sides. So finally, I have that the amount of matter in moles equals the initial amount of matter in moles times the same expression. Further, you can also multiply both sides of the first equation by the atomic mass, gram per mole, then mole cancels out on both sides and you get gram on both sides, so you get actually mass, little m. And therefore the final result is mass equals the initial mass times the same expression. Well, it's quite obvious that uh, coefficient k is the same, it is independent uh, if you consider capital N or little n or little m, number of atoms, amount of matter or mass. Now let me divide uh, the second equation by n0 and make this left-hand side equal to 0 
logically, it corresponds to the time which we call actually the half-life. Now substituting this boundary condition into the second equation, we get the relationship between this decay constant and the half-life. You see they are actually inversely proportional to each other, and we have a coefficient ln2 which equals 0 0.693. Now you can ask me why a methodical engineer or materials engineer should care about radioactive decay of the isotopes at all? Well, let me explain. We have actually two reasons. But basically this is because we want to maximize the number of elements and the number of isotopes we can use in our work. This is our interest to have as many elements, as many isotopes that we can use producing millions of different types of materials. Because if we have more initial elements, then our job is easier. If we have less of them, then our job is actually more difficult. But, on the other hand, we are responsible as engineers. We are responsible for the quality assurance of our material and we are also responsible for the health issues connected with our workers and customers. So this double responsibility uh, will be explained now one by one. So first of all, as materials and metallurgical engineers, we are responsible for the quality assurance of our materials. For me it means that if I produce a material, then this material uh, should be stable in a way that it doesn't change its composition or, well, it might change its composition, but the change should be less than, for example, 0.001% during 1000 years starting from the production. Okay, so that's probably good enough from point of view of quality assurance. Of course, the numbers are discussable. I am showing it as an example. Now, substituting these two values into the second equation, you get that you will obey this condition if the maximum value of the decay constant is 10 to the power minus 8, 1 over years. And then if you substitute that value into this final equation, then you can express the half-life, and then you get the condition expressed in half-life saying that for this to happen, the half-life should be larger than 69.3 million of years. But in fact, uh, this calculation I did now for the element containing a single isotope with a more fraction of 1, but now I can also repeat the same calculation for elements uh, containing several isotopes with different more fractions. And then what is the change? The change is that I should divide the half-life of that isotope by the more fraction of the same isotope. And now this ratio should be higher than the 69.3 million of years for each isotope of that element. And if this is true, then I can guarantee that the composition of material will change less than 0.001% within 1000 years starting from production. And uh, this should be checked for all the isotopes of the given element I want to use. Okay. In the last column of this table, I calculated these values for all the three isotopes of uranium. You see I got anything between 4,000 and 11,000 million of years, which is obviously much larger than the 69.3 million of years as a minimum. It means that to our surprise, maybe to our surprise, uranium actually passed this test. So from the point of view of quality assurance, the constancy of composition of the materials produced, uranium is a good material which can be used by us. Well, of course, supposing it passes the test about uh, the health issues. So now let me talk about that. In the literature, uranium is called weakly radioactive. And unfortunately, among the miners of uranium, the high percentage of cancer was found by medical doctors. 
of course, after they spent long years in uranium mines. Even despite the fact that those people were uh, in contact not with pure uranium, they were in contact only with uranium ores which contained, in the best case scenario, 15% of uranium. And nevertheless, uh, they had this health problem. It is obvious that we, materials engineers, metallurgical engineers, cannot afford to make such a health risk to our workers or to our customers. And therefore, uranium, of course, uh, will not be used for us, at least for purposes, when our material can come into contact with people or living objects. However, remember something else. In the beginning of this lecture, I showed to you, we have actually 32 unstable isotopes, which all belong to stable elements, so-called stable elements. And those 32 unstable isotopes of the 32 stable elements are actually radioactive. Another question is, how we evaluate them? Are they maybe more dangerous than uranium? Or hopefully they are less dangerous? I don't know. I mean, I don't know by definition. I'm an engineer. I should make some calculation to make sure what is the case. You know, I already told you why radioactive decay is dangerous, because these helium uh, nuclei are released by a certain energy. And the higher is the energy of the radioactive decay, the higher is the damage they cause in the tissues of the living objects. So I should evaluate those isotopes according to the energy they produce. But remember the difference between atomic bomb and radioactive decay, the difference is the rate. So of course the rate is very important. I mean if one such a helium isotope is released per, I don't know, billions and billions of years, it is really not a big deal. So. I designed uh, this equation, so I decided that the so-called radioactive power is the uh, parameter by which I can characterize the different isotopes. And this I calculate as the decrease in the mass of the isotope due to radioactive decay multiplied by the delta E value, which is uh, combining the process, which is written here and also it's written in the table. Now, you remember dm over dt equals minus k times little m. This is here, and instead of k, I am using this equation ln2 divided by the half-life. So this is what I get. But of course, it is also important how much of this material I have. I have one gram of the isotope or one ton of the isotope. And therefore, to characterize different isotopes and different elements, let me divide uh, this equation by m, the mass. Then this mass disappears from the right-hand side, but then it appears on the left-hand side. And it is this way I get p over m, which I can call the specific radioactive power of the isotopes. And also, if you remember that isotopes so there are elements which have several isotopes with certain more fractions. So then, of course, you should sum uh, for each element according to those isotopes and multiply the result by the x of the given isotope, which is the more fraction. And we end up in such uh, an equation. So we created uh, the way how to calculate the specific radioactive power of an isotope, or actually element z. And now I actually calculated it for the three isotopes of uranium. So these values are between 0 0.04 to 0 0.09 Watt per ton. The sum for uranium ends up in 0 0.21 Watt per ton. So we can make a conclusion that if the value of for the given element is the same, then it's already so-called weakly radioactive. But it also means that such an isotope or such an element cannot be used for engineering purposes. So the next task is to check 
this equation for all the 32 unstable isotopes of the so-called stable elements and to see whether uh, the result is similar or even maybe higher or maybe much much lower compared to these values and then we can make the conclusion. Now I want to check the 32 unstable isotopes of the stable elements. First I am checking them for quality assurance. You remember we agreed that if we want to make sure that even not 0.001% of composition, composition change takes place in the material within 1000 years, then the ratio of the half-life to the mole fraction of the isotope should be above 69 millions of years. On the x-axis of this diagram you see again the atomic number and on the y-axis you see the ratio of this half-life to mole fraction in years but 10th uh, logarithm of course. So the red horizontal broken line is a demarcation line corresponding to the 69 millions of years. Above the line are those points which have a higher value so they pass this test and below the line are those points which don't pass the test because they have the lower values. You can see that all the green points which correspond to stable elements uh, passing this test. I promised you to show bismuth, so here is the point for bismuth. And even among the uh, radioactive elements, thorium and uranium pass the test. So, uh, except the 11 radioactive elements, natural elements, all the others, so the 81 stable elements plus thorium uranium, uh, pass this test so they can be used from at least the point of view of quality assurance. And now let me check the same from point of view of health issues. You remember to check this we introduced a new quantity called specific radioactive power. This is how it is calculated and now in this graph on x-axis we see again the atomic number, on the y-axis we see the specific radioactive power in watt per ton, again 10 logarithm. You remember for uranium we got 0.21 watt per ton, meaning in logarithm uh, values it is just a little bit below uh, zero. You also can see that all the green points are safely below all the red triangles, including uranium. Uranium actually has the lowest value among the radioactive elements, and that was uh, my choice by purpose, because I wanted to compare the stable elements to the most stable radioactive element, uranium. Now, the conclusion is, that all the unstable isotopes of the stable elements are uh, less dangerous by four orders of magnitude compared to uranium. And uranium is called weakly radioactive. So the specific radioactive power of all the radioactive isotopes of the stable elements are lower than that of uranium by at least 10,000 times. Again, I promise you bismuth, so bismuth is uh, less dangerous than uranium by 10 orders of magnitude. You remember we call uranium as a weakly radioactive element, so if uh, the other elements are less active by 10,000 times or more, I think uh, we can responsibly say that all those 81 so-called stable elements which we found in the previous lecture, they can be safely used. Now let me talk about the 24 artificial elements of the physicists. On X I show again the atomic number, by blue points I am showing the 24 artificial elements and they start with uh, atomic number 95 and go until atomic number 118. 
on the y-axis I am showing the half-life in years its logarithm and here I am showing what I mean like 10 billion years which is uh, almost the same as the age of the universe 100 thousand years one year five minute and three milliseconds you can see that uh, the values for the blue points decrease gradually as the atomic number increases and actually uh, the highest value so the most stable of these artificial elements uh, has a couple of uh, millions of years of half-life but then increasing the atomic number it goes below one second you know what the one second means by the way you remember what is the half-life so I put here one kilogram of that sample after one second half of it is gone I mean it is transformed into something else uh, within one second and then during the second second uh, the rest the half of the rest is gone during the third second the half of the rest of the rest is gone etc 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 so in fact it is even very difficult to find whether this element is formed or not because from the time of its formation to the time of this analysis usually some uh, time is passed you know I am not asking a question why the physicists are uh, going further why are they working on the creation of element number 119 because obviously they have right to ask scientific questions they have right to go on and uh, look what we look for the new knowledge what we don't know yet but from the point of view of engineering from the point of view that we materials engineers and metallurgical engineers need to have as many elements as possible to create useful materials unfortunately we have a very little chance that in the future uh, in this way at least the physicists will find any element which will be useful in us, enough for us I'm sorry for that but this is uh, my conclusion now let me show to you how to calculate the molar mass of the compounds or molecules you remember when we modeled the atomic mass of the isotopes or the elements we used this correction factor coming from Albert Einstein and so in the first approximation I also want to use that to see if in this case we need such corrections or not for that let me use the most extreme extreme case uh, which is possible for compounds molecules or even solutions or alloys and this is minus 1000 kilojoule per mole atom actually I don't think such a value exists in nature I am using this value to make sure I don't make a mistake so this is the most negative value possible and then if we substitute into this equation then we can conclude that in the worst case scenario the correction to the molar mass of the compound will be 10 to the power minus 8 gram per mole atom you remember the lightest element hydrogen has the atomic mass of 1 gram per mole compared to that the correction is 8 orders of magnitude and of course if you take a more heavy atom then we will have the correction even less than uh, this eight, eighth digit you also remember I wanted to know the atomic masses of all the elements with four digits of accuracy obviously uh, this is also my goal when I talk about the molar mass of the compounds and therefore we can conclude that this correction is negligible when we talk about calculating the molar mass of the compounds molecules or alloys from the atomic masses of the elements therefore the calculation is very simple suppose I want to calculate the molar mass of compound AABB small letters mean stomatic coefficients which are integer numbers capital letters mean the symbols of the elements 
So in this case, I take Ma, which is the atomic mass of component A in gram per mole atom, multiply it by the stomatic coefficient of the same component, so I get a product. And the same product should be calculated for each component of the same component. And when all those products are ready, they should be just added, and then I get gram per mole molecule. So I get the mass of one mole of such a molecule. Actually, I can obtain the same in the unit of gram per mole atom. For that, I need to divide the previous equation by A plus B, and A plus B is the number of atoms in the molecule. So, uh, comparing to the atomic mass of the elements, the first value in gram per mole molecule is always larger in the value as any of the atomic mass of any of the elements. However, the second value obtained in gram per mole atom is an average between the two atomic mass of the two elements, and even this is a weight average, weight through the mole fraction of the components in the uh, molecule. By the way, if we have a stoichiometric component such as H2O, for example, then uh, we use usually gram per mole molecule, but in some calculations we use also gram per mole atom. Now, for solutions and alloys which have not an exact stoichiometry, I mean not a special exact stoichiometry, then we usually use the second version. Let me show to you the example. Let us uh, suppose that uh, this is molecule AB, so small a is 1 and small b is also 1. Now MA, let it be 10 gram per mole atom, MB, let it be 20 gram per mole atom. And then from the first equation we get 30 gram per mole molecule. From the second equation we get 30 divided by 2, which means 15 grams per mole atom. You should understand that these two results are identical. The 30 gram per mole molecule and the 15 gram per mole atom are identical. And we should use these particular units, gram per mole molecule or gram per mole atom, to make sure it is not confused. Because if you use only the simple unit gram per mole, and then one person claims he got 30 gram per mole, another person claims she got 15 gram per mole, now then how they can agree? They think there is a disagreement between them, but in fact this disagreement can be resolved by using proper detailed units, gram per mole molecule or gram per mole atom. Okay, so finally, let me summarize how we calculate the moment, amount of matter in a sample. Well, we measure its mass, then we measure its composition, then from the composition using the tables we get the molar masses of the elements, and then if we have compounds or alloys, then we use uh, one of these formula. By the way, only one comment here. You remember from the 81 stable elements, we have six problematic elements. The most problematic is lithium, for which the, we have uh, the uncertainty in the atomic mass higher than the four digits accuracy. So for them, we are not sure about the atomic mass, but we can be sure if we measure the specific sample by mass spectrometry. Okay, that we discussed before. And finally, if we have all these uh, molar masses or atomic masses, then we use the equation that the amount of matter equals the mass divided by the molar mass. Kilogram divided by kilogram per mole, kilogram cancels out, mole remains. Okay, now let me use this very simple equation with the previous two calculated values, supposing that the mass of the sample is 30 grams. In the first case, the 30 grams are divided by the 30 gram per mole molecule. 30 per 30 is 1. Gram cancels out, and then uh, we get 1 mole molecule, the amount of matter 
in the 30 grams of the sample. Now let us substitute the second value. So the 30 grams are divided by 15 gram per mole atom. So 30 divided by 15 is 2. Gram is cancelled out and we get 2 mole atoms. Again, these two results, the 1 mole molecule and the 2 mole atoms are identical. Why? Because we agreed that we are this time talking about molecule AB, each molecule containing two atoms. And so it's clear that in one mole of the molecule we have really two moles of the atoms. Because in one molecule we have two atoms. You know it is really simple. Simple especially if you are careful and you use this detailed unit instead of a simple unit of gram per mole. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are quite close to the end of this fourth lecture about the uh, physical fundamentals of the coarse equilibrium of materials because we know everything about the atomic mass. But, unfortunately, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, UPOC, made some mess again. Uh, please note, I don't mean the individual chemists. They are great people, but this international organization is doing strange things, to my opinion. For example, instead of atomic mass, as we used so far, and the corresponding unit of gram per mole, they use atomic weight, but use the same unit of gram per mole which is contradictory, because what is weight? Weight is force due to gravity. That force is measured in Newton. So if UPOC wants to talk about atomic weight, then why they don't use the unit of Newton per mole? No, they talk about atomic weight, proudly, by the way, and still use the unit of gram per mole, although all we know that gram is a unit for mass and not for weight which is the force due gravity. Well, this international organization uh, made uh, some mess also before. Thanks to them, we have the overcomplicated definition of the Avogadro number, and also the nine digits of that number, and also we call that number some huge natural constant instead of uh, recognizing that this is actually the arbitrary number. Also, the same organization pushed mole into the box of base units, needlessly and incorrectly. And this time they call atomic weight and measure it in gram per mole. Well, you know, I think uh, it's time to resist. I don't want to become absolutely fool. And my best suggestion to my international students and all to my listeners is that, well, listen to your minds. Listen to your own reason and decide for yourself. Do you really want to call molar weight something which is measured in gram per mole? Well, I don't suggest to, to do so. But once uh, we started to call about the weight versus the mass, then let me really talk a little bit about the gravity, of course, after Isaac Newton. His equation says that the gravi gravitational attraction between two masses can be calculated uh, as the multiplication of these two masses by the gravitational constant, which is here, divided by square of the distance of the centers of uh, masses of these two objects. Now, on the surface of the Earth, we usually use it, this equation in the form m times g small, m is the mass of the object on the surface of the Earth, and g is the gravitational acceleration. If in this case, uh, g small equals m capital times g capital divided by uh, l capital square, where m capital should be then the mass of the Earth, and l capital should be then the radius of the Earth. I hope you all remember, my international students, that g small is approximately 9.81 meter per second square. Now let me show to you how it comes. Substituting the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth into this equation, uh, 
you can calculate this value well if you use of course the radius of the earth along the poles and then you get 9.86 meter per second square for gravitational acceleration well this is not really 9.81 i'm sorry why so and this is so because earth is not a perfect sphere so it has a smaller radius along the poles and the larger radius along the equator so the two should be of course compensating so using uh, the radius along the equator i get 9.80 something meter per second square and if i take the average of the two i still have 9.83 meter per second square which is still not what i want or what i remember from school 9.81 what is the reason well the reason is that you actually have the second force acting uh, along the equator and this understanding is due to the hungarian physicist otto schlorand who is probably the only uh, scientists of the 19th century who was known and recognized internationally he actually uh, declared the principle of equivalence which simply means that the different uh, types of acceleration should be added according to their size now by the way in this first equation according to newton this fg is the gravitation force we call it the weight so this is the mass times this acceleration and now uh, this uh, vector shows uh, towards the center of the earth okay what Utrecht is talking about he's talking about the fact which we all know that the earth rotates along uh, the plane of its equator well it makes one rotation each day so that's why the daytime and the night time is changing each 24 hours as we all know but that gives another acceleration and that's called the centrifugal force let me explain it on the example of a carousel you know the carousel is going around usually children are sitting on it but sometimes i also like sitting on it so my uh, mass is m I am traveling along the perimeter of the carousel by the linear speed of v and the radius of the carousel is r and then this is the way how to calculate the centrifugal force which is trying to push me out of the carousel so i need to keep strongly by my hand to make sure i am not falling out of the carousel okay now if you yes and this equation can be rearranged similarly as the equation of newton because this m times gc gc is now the acceleration due to the you know, centrifugal force and calculating uh, it for uh, the surface of the earth along the equator taking into account the speed of rotation of the earth uh, then we get uh, the value the gc value 0 0.034 meter per second square of course with minus well minus is minus uh, relative to this g which is uh, plus here so the uh, classical force or weight uh, as a vector shows towards the center of gravity now the second vector due to the centrifugal force shows out of the center of gravity so now taking the difference between nine eight zero and zero point zero three four we get the final value of nine point seventy six meter per second square and this is the effective gravitational acceleration along the equator by the way uh, the second term due to centrifugal force doesn't exist along the poles now if i take the average of the value obtained for the poles and the average of these effective value obtained for the equator now then finally get uh, the big average of 9.81 plus minus 0 0.05 meter per second square and this 9.81 is something which i really remember from school well you might be surprised why we have this inaccuracy which is in the third digit uh, i mean if we have it then it is a big problem then how we measure everything with the four digits of accuracy 
But this is actually not really an inaccuracy, this is just a variation of this g value along the surface of the Earth if you travel from the poles towards the equator through the city of Miskolc. In fact, it's not a real problem because in fact, our laboratories are fixed in certain cities. Those cities have the local gravitational accelerations, which is known, which is measured. And that's why when you establish a scale in your lab, then you can calibrate the scale according to the local uh, gravitational acceleration. And then this uncertainty doesn't exist. Okay, let me, by the way, use the same equation with Newton to estimate what is the effect of the Sun on measuring the mass on Earth. So I get a surprisingly high value, 6 times 10 to the power minus 3 meter per second square, which is at least within the four digits of accuracy. So it seems that Sun has an influence on measuring mass on Earth. Well, you know, Sun can be above us, can, Sun can be behind us, I mean during the daytime and during the nighttime, and if you are measuring the same mass during the daytime and during the nighttime, you can have different values because of the Sun. Well, making the same calculation for the Moon, you get a value which is 200 times less compared to the effect of the Sun. But at this moment I'm a little bit surprised because, well, I heard I mean, of course, I'm not an expert, but I heard several times discussions of uh, big, big scientists explaining that uh, ocean tides, the low tide and the high tide, is due to the effect of gravity of the moon. But then how is that if the uh, sun has 200 times larger effect than the moon? So in my engineering understanding, the basic reason of tides, low tide and high tides of oceans, should be due to sun, and maybe there is a secondary reason or a secondary effect of the Moon. Well, as a scientist, I should also evaluate my own influence. I have the mass of 100 kilograms, of course, heavily dressed. And then I can come as close as 0 0.1 meter to the sample when we measure its mass or weight. And this influence is really negligible. So my personal influence is negligible, the influence of the Moon is negligible, but the influence of the Sun is not fully negligible. By the way, uh, the balance of these two equations are quite important for our lives. And this is because the balance of these two equations guarantees the stable orbit of the Earth around the Sun. You know, the first equation tries to pull us into the Sun, I mean the whole Earth. And if that happened, it would become very, very hot very soon. Now the second equation, the centrifugal force, tries to push us out from the solar system. And if that happened, that would be very, very cold very, very soon. Now fortunately, none of them happens because these two forces are in equilibrium. And that's why our orbit, I mean the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, is more or less constant. So we get more or less the same amount of heat every day from the Sun on Earth. Now the same story, by the way, with the Moon. Because the Moon is orbiting the Earth and we don't lose it. And it also doesn't fall into the Earth, which is quite good because it would be quite painful. And by the way, this second equation, the centrifugal force, is important for us to design uh, these forces to separate the isotopes. Now let me show to some classical uh, scales to measure mass. Uh, we have two tabs which are equilibrated. In one of, into one of the tiers we put our sample to be measured, into another uh, uh, tier we put these standard masses. Of course they are labeled like uh, 100 gram, etc, etc, etc. And then of course we need to reach mechanical equilibrium between the two. Now this device is actually genius from point of view that any influence, uh, whether we measure on the equator, or on the poles, or in the city of Miskolc, or during the daytime, nighttime, full moon, half moon, whatever. So whatever, influ whatever influence from the gravitational accelerations are cancelled, 
because we have the two terms. They are quite close to each other, so the gravitational acceleration is pretty the same for both of them with uh, many, many digits of accuracy. And during the equilibration, these two constants, which are pretty the same, they simply cancel out. So the same device can be used along the equator, along the pole, it doesn't need any calibration. Well, it's true, but of course these so-called standard masses can corrode. We need to be very careful to have to, to put the, these cars uh, horizontally and to have it uh, kept in good order. Nowadays, nobody is really using such scales. We usually use electronic scales. We have this G, but this is not the gravitational acceleration, ladies and gentlemen. This is grams. So whatever number you see here, this will be in the gram, the mass of the sample. And this is because this electronic device, these electronic scales, I keep it so-called autom automatic zero-point correction and also they have a switch called tear so if you push that uh, switch before each measurement then you can uh, be sure more or less that what you measure is the actual mass because all the effects are built into this uh, zero-point correction and by the way also because these scales are calibrated uh, when they are purchased according to the local uh, gravitational acceleration. Now the last point I uh, must explain to you, it is connected with my decision that I don't want to use mass percent along this course, I want to use more percent. When I uh, told you that, I explained it by saying that this is because gravity has absolutely nothing to do with the interaction of atoms and ions. So to prove that to you, let me make an example. I am using the same equation of Newton, you know, gravitational attraction, and I uh, just reorganize it to calculate the molar energy of interaction of, mole of one mole of sodium ions with mo one mole of chlorine ions. Well, I know the masses, I know the uh, radii, and so uh, I know the distance, and therefore everything is pretty uh, simple here, and what I can obtain is the order of magnitude 10 to the power minus 28 joule per mole. Now, this value is very, very, very far from reality of how really sodium and chlorine ions interact, and the value is much, much less than the real energy of interaction. Okay, now, what is instead? So, if it's not gravity, then uh, what we should use? Now, we should remember that uh, we have the so-called Coulomb law, which describes the interaction between the charges of the ions, and you remember we have the charges on these ions, which equal to the Faraday constant. But by the way, uh, let me just show to you shortly that the two equations are a little bit similar. In the equation of Newton, we multiply the two masses, and then multiply these by a constant and divide by the square of the distance. Now in the Coulomb law, we multiply the two charges and not the masses, multiply these by another constant but divide by the same square of the distance. Okay, substituting the values for sodium and chlorine, we get the value close to minus 500 kJ per mole. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, this is quite close to reality. I don't claim it is exactly the same as a real measurable quantity because, of course, uh, this model is very, very simplistic as it is today, but it is uh, good in order of magnitude, it's good even in value, it's good in, in sign, it's, it's fine. So this is really what is happening. So we have strong chemical bonds in ionic compounds because those ions are attracted due to the Coulomb law. 
So the final conclusion is that the difference between these two approaches is 33 orders of magnitude. And the effect of gravity is absolutely negligible when we talk about the interaction of atoms and ions. But of course, it doesn't mean gravity is negligible all the time. Gravity is still very important when we talk about the interaction between the planets or the people standing on the planets, etc., etc. Okay? What I mean now, interaction of atoms and ions, now in this business of material science, gravitational force is negligible. And that is why I don't use mass percent in this subject. I rather use mole percent, because mole percent tells me the ratio of different atoms and ions. And you remember the uh, ionic compound, lithium oxide, Li2O. And this is stable because of the certain stoichiometry, of the certain ratio of the atoms or ions. So two ions of lithium and one ion of oxygen makes a stable compound. And that has nothing to do with gravity. Now finally, I am shooting, showing to you short sentences as a summary after this quite a long lecture. I am not reading them up to you because I have been talking about uh, all of them. I rather stop now. Now you can, if you like, you can stop also the video to read all the sentences. But while you are stopping the video, I am actually saying goodbye to you. Thank you for your attention. If I am still alive during these coronavirus times, I am coming back with lecture number five. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.